Welcome back from the break. We hope you're able to warm your coffee or tea to enjoy during the next few presentations in Session 6. Noteworthy complex generic drug approvals, oral locally acting, and oral suspension drug products. Our first presenter will be Dr. Ouija Sun, Senior Staff Fellow, Division of Therapeutic Performance 2 in the Office of Research and Standards OGD. Next, we'll welcome Dr. Manar Algabish, Senior Staff Fellow, Division of Therapeutic Performance 2, Office of Research and Standards and OGD. And our final presentation will be provided by Dr. Suman Dandamande, Senior Pharmacologist, Division of Bioequivalence 3, Office of Bioequivalence and OGD. Please join me to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Ouija Sun. Thank you for the introduction. This section is not worth the complex generic drug approvals, oral locally acting, and the oral suspension drug products. My presentation title is Bioequivalence for Oral Locally Acting Gastrointestinal Drug Products. For this presentation, I will give B recommendations for oral locally acting dry drug products and the rationales of B recommendations. For the learning objectives, the first one is to identify B approaches for oral locally acting dry drug products. The second one is to provide examples of oral locally acting dry drug products to establish BE. The third objective is to explain the rationales of B recommendations. For the locally acting dry drug product, drug substance may or may not be absorbed into the systemic circulation. So B recommendations are based on drug product properties and the product's mechanism of action. If a drug product is systematically absorbed, several in vivo study methods could be used to establish BE, including pharmacokinetic study, pharmacodynamic studies, comparative clinical endpoint B studies. Depends on the property of the drug substance or drug products, in vitro studies may be recommended. If a drug product is not systemically absorbed, or the drug absorption is very limited, it is not possible to measure drug concentration in plasma. So PK study cannot be used to establish BE between the test product and the reference standard. Instead, the PD study and the comparative clinical endpoint B study can be used. In vitro study may be recommended as well. As mentioned in the previous slide, because of different drug properties and the mechanism of action, methods to establish BE could be varied from products to products. For some of products, it may just recommend in vitro studies to establish BE, such as surveillance products. For some products, they may have options of in vitro studies or in vivo studies. Vancomycin hydrochloride capsule is an example or both in vitro study and in vivo studies are recommended, such as mesalamine products. Sometimes only in vivo studies are recommended for B establishment. Then this is the challenge question one. If a drug product is not systemically absorbed, which of the following is not an adequate method to establish BE? A, PD study. B, in vitro study, C, PK study, D, comparative clinical endpoint B study. The correct answer is C. If a drug product is not systemically absorbed, it is not possible to determine PK parameters. So PK study cannot be used to establish BE between the test product and the reference standard. As mentioned before, the B recommendations are based on drug product properties and the product's mechanism of action. For the following slides, I will provide four cases for B establishment 
and the rationales of bead recommendations due to the different properties and the mechanism of drop products. The first case is Cervelomer drop products. Cervelomer carbonate has two dosage forms, tablet and the powder for suspension. Currently, there are 10 approved ANDAS for tablet and the 5 approved ANDAS for powder for suspension. Cervelomer carbonate products are for the control of the serum phosphorus. Cervelomer carbonate is non absorbent phosphate binding cross linking polymer. It contains multiple armies under polymer backbones. These armies can bind to phosphate molecules through ionic and hydrogen binding, and then forms insoluble complex. This insoluble complex will be eliminated in the feces. Therefore, surveillance components can decrease phosphate concentration in the serum. Because of the mechanism of surveillance components, the bioavailability of these products are very low, and the PK studies is not feasible to determine the B for generic drug products. So instead of urine PK studies, in vitro studies are recommended to establish BE for surveillance component products. In the product specific guidance, it recommends API SEMNIS, in vitro kinetic binding study, and the in vitro equilibrium binding study. Surveillance component is a polymeric drug substance and is considered as a complex API. So the API sameness demonstration is recommended. API sameness determination is based on the totality of the evidence, such as manufacturing process of the API and the comparative physical chemical characterizations. All of the factors will be taken into the consideration when developing B recommendations and reviewing end products with complex API. For surveillance, the API sameness could be supported by API synthetic route and the comparative characterization results of the test and the reference APIs, including but not limited to degree of cross-linking, degree of the protonation, particle size, elemental analysis, swirling index, etc. Because the mechanism of surveillance is to bind to phosphate molecules to have therapeutic efficacy, in vitro kinetic binding study and the in vitro equilibrium binding studies are recommended to establish BE. For in vitro kinetic binding study, it can assess the rate of the binding and demonstrate how much time is required to reach the maximum binding where phosphate concentration is fixed in the binding solution. So it can identify that how much incubation duration is needed for equilibrium, which, which support the equilibrium binding study. The right figure is an example of kinetic binding profiles to compare test product and the reference standards. X axis is the time and the Y axis is percentage of phosphate binding. To conduct the in vitro kinetic binding study, at least at different length of the time should be used to incubate test product and the reference standard. The selecting time should show that the maximum binding is rich. So from the figure, you can see that the amount or the percentage of the phosphate binding increase when the binding time increase, and then it reached to plateau, which is the maximum binding. For the test product and the reference standard comparison, the value of T to R ratio should be compared, but it is not for 90% confidence interval evaluation. For the in vitro equilibrium binding study, it can be used to calculate the affinity and the capacity binding constants. In vitro equilibrium binding study is considered as the pivotal study and is used for biowaver decision for the additional strengths. To conduct the in vitro equilibrium binding study, it is performed under the conditions of the specified time, which is usually equilibrium binding time, and the varying absorbed concentrations, which is phosphate concentration for surveillance component products. The figure here is an example of equilibrium binding profiles. X axis is the initial absorbed concentration, and the Y axis is bound absorbed. 
the selective concentration should be contained the increasing portion of the binding curve until the maximum binding is reached. To ensure the maximum binding, it should include at least two concentrations at parietal. In addition, because adsorbent may have different affinity to API under different pH conditions, different adsorbent conditions may be applied. This slide is the case example for NDI review. The PSG for surveillance components recommends two pH conditions for binding study, pH 4 and pH 7. In this end out, the applicant selected the same phosphate concentration range for both pH 4 and the pH 7. Phosphate has higher affinity to surveillance at pH 7 than pH 4 due to the different ionization state of phosphate species. Therefore, from the in vitro equilibrium binding study under these two conditions, it reached two equilibrium for pH 7 conditions but did not reach two equilibrium under pH 4 conditions. This case shows adequate phosphate concentrations should be applied under different conditions. The second case is mesalamine drug products. Mesalamine contains two delayed release dosage forms, including DR capsule and the DR tablet. It also has one extended release capsule. There are one to six approved endas for each dosage forms. Mesalamine is for the treatment of active ulcerative colitis. It has a topical anti-inflammatory effect on chronic epithelial cells. Although mesalamine is for the locally treatment, the bioavailability is about 20 to 35 percent, depends on the drug products. For B recommendations of mesalamine DR products and the ER products, they are similar but still have some minor differences. For PK study, fasting and fat studies are recommended for both DR and the ER products. However, the partial AUC is different. For DR product, partial AUC is recommended from 8 to 48 hours. For ER product, partial AUC is recommended from 0 to 3 hours and 3 hours to less measurable time point. Comparative dissolution testing under various pH conditions is recommended for both DR and ER products. Dissolution similarity factor, which is F2, is evaluated to compare test product and the reference standards. However, because the dissolution of the DR dosage form shows high variability, the product specific guidance recommends 24 units of the test product and at least two lots of the reference standards to compare the dissolution testing. This slide shows the review for highly variable dissolution data, which is mesalamine DR product. If the dissolution profile is highly variable, the bootstrapping method is used to calculate mean data and the lower bound of 90% confidence interval of the F2 values. To do this, first, it can compare test and the reference. If both mean data and the lower bound of 90% confidence interval are above the acceptable limit, then the dissolution result meet the acceptance criteria. If F2 does not pass the acceptable limit, we can further calculate the data between two lots of the reference standards, and then compare the value of the test versus reference to reference versus reference for the dissolution evaluation. Please note that methods other than bootstrapping method with sufficient justification are also acceptable for highly variable dissolution data. For the rationales of B recommendations, the PK study is recommended because the bioavailability of the mesalamine is about 20 to 35 percent, so the drug concentration in plasma is measurable. For PK parameters, in addition to AUC and Cmax, partial AUC is recommended. Partial AUC can reflect drug absorption in dry tract. In addition, it helps discriminate the formation differences between the test and the reference standard. In vitro competitive dissolution study in different pH can ensure the test product to have similar dissolution behaviors as the reference standard, 
it serves as a surrogate of in vivo drug release in the GI tract. Mesalamine toxic forms have high dissociation variability. More units of products help to perform bootstrapping F2 analysis. The next case is vancomycin hydrochloride capsule. For vancomycin hydrochloride capsule, it has five approved endards. Vancomycin acts locally in the lower dry tract. The indication is for the treatment of C. difficile associated diarrhea and the staphyla carco enterocolitis. The mechanism is through the inhibition of the cell wall biosynthesis of bacteria. For the drug absorption, vancomycin is poorly absorbed. So the vancomycin concentration measurement is very limited in plasma after oral administration. For B establishment, there are two options for vancomycin hydrochloride capsule. For the first one, if test product and the RLD are Q1 and Q2 the same, B can be established during in vitro competitive dissolution testing under 0.1 N hydrochloride, pH 4.5 and pH 6.8. And then F2 is evaluated to compare test and the reference. The F2 evaluation is similar to mesalamine drug product. If it is not Q1 and Q2 the same for the test product and the RLD, instead of in vitro testing, an in vivo competitive clinical endpoint B study should be conducted to demonstrate BE. For the rationales of B recommendations, because the absorption of vancomycin is very limited, it is not possible to use PK study to demonstrate BE, which is different from mesalamine drug products. For the API properties, vancomycin is highly soluble across pH in the GI tract. So in vitro dissolution testing can be used to predict drug in vivo release behavior. If test product and the RLD are Q1 and the Q2 the same, the impact of excipients on absorption or other in vivo performance is minimized. In this case, in vitro competitive dissolution testing can be used to establish BE. However, if the test product and the RLD are not Q1 and Q2 the same, certain excipients may have impact on drug in vivo performance, which is unknown. Therefore, the competitive clinical endpoints B study is recommended to establish BE. The final case is Fudasomycin drug product. Fudasomycin has two dosage forms tablet and suspension. Currently, there is no approved ENDA for both dosage forms. Fudasomycin is for the treatment of C. difficile associated diarrhea. It is an antibacterial drug by inhibiting RNA synthesis of bacteria. For API properties, the permeability and the absorption are poor, but small amount of API can still be absorbed into the body. A little similar to vancomycin hydrochloride capsule, there are two options for B establishment. If test product and the RLD are Q1 and Q2 the same, in vitro competitive dissolution testing is recommended to evaluate dissolution similarity between the test and the reference. The difference from the vancomycin hydrochloride capsule is that for fludasomycin, PK studies, including fasting and fat studies, are recommended. If test product and the IOD are not Q1 and Q2 the same, a competitive clinical endpoint B study is recommended to demonstrate BE. For the rationales of B recommendations, if test product and the IOD are Q1 and Q2 the same, the impact of excipients on drug in vivo performance, such as absorption, can be minimized. Although fludasomycin is poorly permeable and soluble, there is no analytical sensitivity issue to determine drug concentration in plasma, so PK study is recommended. However, the API is not stable during GI transit. Equivalent systemic PK does not guarantee 
equivalent amount of the API at the site of action. So PK studies serve as a complementary measure. Competitive in vitro dissolution studies can simulate and evaluate competitive drug release behavior between the test product and the reference standard in different portions of the GI tract. It is critical to assess BE. If test product and the ILD are not Q1 and Q2 the same, different types and the amount of the excipient may have different impact on in vivo performance at the site of action. Therefore, the competitive clinical endpoint B study is recommended to establish BE. Challenge question 2. Which of the following is the consideration to develop a BE recommendations for oral locally acting dry drug? A. Mechanism of drug products. B. Systemic or non systemic absorption of drug products. C. Physical property of drug products. D. All of the above. The correct answer is D. Mechanism of drug products, absorption of drug products, and the physical property of drug products are all considered for B recommendation development. There are two ongoing grants under the GUTUFA. The purpose of these grants intends to develop a bioprediction dissociation method and establish modeling to support B demonstration for generic locally acting dry drug products. The ultimate goal is that it can establish alternative approach to demonstrate BE between the test product and the ILD. To summarize, for locally acting GI drug, systemic exposure may not reflect drug concentration at the site of action. In addition, drug plasma concentration may be limited, so it needs adequate method to establish BE. For BE recommendations, of the oral locally acting dry drug product, we consider drug product properties and the mechanism of action. There is ongoing research. The purpose is to improve in vitro dissociation method and the developer predictive in silico model to support the B determination. Finally, I would like to thank Merna, Yasmin, Heather, Myungjin, Lei, and Rob for their input and suggestion for the slides and the presentation. That's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and good morning, everyone. In the second presentation of this session, I will be talking about Q1, Q2 recommendations of locally acting gastrointestinal or GI drugs with a focus on sucrophate oral suspension as a key case study. From this presentation, you will learn to define qualitative or Q1 and quantitative or Q2 sameness and employ best practices in determining Q1, Q2 sameness. You will recognize the different scenarios where Q1, Q2 sameness is recommended for locally acting GI drugs. You will describe a key case study of Q1, Q2 recommendations for locally acting GI drugs, which is sucrophate. And finally, you will describe the rationale behind bioequivalence or BE recommendations of sucrophate oral suspension. Starting with the first objective, what is Q1, Q2 sameness? Q1, Q2 is an assessment of the inactive ingredients in the proposed generic drug product compared to the inactive ingredients in the reference illicit drug or RLD, where Q1 same means the inactive ingredients are the same, and Q2 same mean the concentration of the inactive ingredients are the same. Please note here that the current FDA's practice generally allows a plus or minus 5% difference in the amount of an active ingredient compared to that of the RLD. 
But why Q1, Q2? Generic oral drug products are not expected to be Q1, Q2 the same as their RLD, which is in contrast to non-oral drug product, such as parenteral, otic, or ophthalmic drug products that are generally expected and in certain cases are required to be Q1, Q2 same as RLD. However, in certain cases, inactive ingredients may impact either the availability of the drug at the site of action or the product performance or both. An example will be a bile salt or a surfactant that acts as an absorption enhancer in products of low permeability drugs. And in such cases, Q1 is same and Q2 same or similar, depends on the case, are recommended. So we covered the what and the why, and now how to determine Q1 and Q2 sameness. While developing an oral drug product for an abbreviated new drug application, or ENDA, a firm can ensure that the product is Q1, Q2 the same as the RLD by checking the product qualitative composition in the approved labeling of the RLD, and the firm can also submit a controlled correspondence requesting to check if the proposed formulations are suitable for BE approach with the condition that the product specific guidance of the product include a Q1, Q2 recommendation. To learn more about that, please refer to the general guidance linked in the slide. For locally acting GI drug, there are several PSG that include Q1, Q2 recommendations as listed on the right side, such as a carbose tablet, dinaclotide capsule, and vancomycin hydrochloride capsule. The Q1, Q2 sameness in, the P in these PSGs is either a prerequisite to waive in vivo studies with pharmacokinetic endpoints, such as the PE recommendations for vancomycin hydrochloride capsule that Dr. Sun described earlier, a prerequisite to waive in vivo studies with clinical endpoint, such as the PE recommendation for Efaximin tablet and Fidaxomycin products that also Dr. Son discussed, a prerequisite to waive in vivo studies with pharmacodynamic endpoint, such as the BE recommendation for a carbose tablet, and combined with in vitro studies for BE determination, which is the only BE option for sucrophate products and barium sulfate products. And now we stop at our first challenge question. One reason a PSG of an oral drug product to recommend Q1, Q2 sameness is, A, as a prerequisite to waive in vivo BE studies, B, to ensure the particle size of the excipients is the same, C, to encourage developing generic drug products that are the same as the RLD. I will give you a few seconds to think about the answer. And the right answer is A. Particle size are not part of a qualitative or quantitative sameness. And oral drug products are not expected to be Q1 and Q2 same. But in certain cases, if the products are Q1 and Q2, um, an alternative BE approach to that of the in vivo study can be used. Moving to our key case study of this talk, which is sucrophate oral suspension. To start, sucrophate is a locally acting agent that is indicated in the short term 
up to eight weeks treatment of active duodenal ulcer. It is minimally absorbed from the GI tract and structurally sucral fate is an aluminum salt of sucrose octasulfate. Here I want to bring an important point that sucral fate products which are tablets or suspension are classified as complex products because they work locally, complex route, and because the active pharmaceutical ingredient or the API itself is classified also as complex. In this table, I listed the approved sucral fate product in the United States, including the generics and their RLD, as well as the PSG of the products. From the table, you can see that the first PSG of sucral fate drug products were withdrawn in 2015. And I want to talk in the following slides about the history of the PE recommendations and the developments of the current PE recommendations specifically to sucral fate suspension. The first PSG of sucral fate suspension recommended an in vivo BE study with clinical endpoint that included patients with active duodenal ulcer. And this PSG was withdrawn because it was considered unethical to enroll patients who are H. pylori positive without providing standard therapy in the placebo arm. On the other hand, the recruitment of patients who are H. pylori negative would significantly limit the enrollment. And that resulted in the need for the development of an alternative approach for BE evaluation. The rationale behind this alternative approach is developing an in vitro method based on the understanding of the product specific factors and the drug mechanism of action. The process of developing BE recommendation for sucral fate suspension, including collecting information about sucral fate mechanism of action, the administration of the suspension, the formulation, manufacturing process of the API and the suspension, conducted in vitro and in vivo studies from different resources, including RLD labeling and the submission, and literature, and as well as the lab research effort in developing in vitro methods related to the performance of sucral phase suspension. All this effort led to the development of the PSG and help in the approval of the first generic of sucral fade suspension. Revealing the current BE recommendation of sucral fade suspension, which include first sameness of the API, especially that, as we said earlier, sucral fade is a complex API. Two, comparative physiochemical characterization of product, since the product attributes can impact the quality, physical stability, and performance of sucral fate suspension. And finally, bioassays of the products, including binding study. Those in vitro bioassay studies are based on the mechanism of action of sucral fate. In addition to the sameness assessment of API and comparative in vitro testing of both the proposed test and reference standard, the test product should be Q1 and Q2 the same as RLD. The recommendation of sameness applies to all inactive ingredients except for flavor or color. Ready for our second challenge question? 
Which of the following is false regard sucral fate suspension? A. It contains a complex active pharmaceutical ingredient. B. It is considered complex due to its route of administration. Its current BE recommendations include a BE studies with pharmacokinetic endpoints. D. Its current BE recommendation include in vitro binding studies. Few seconds. And the right answer is C. BE of sucralfate products include in vitro studies and sucralfate is minimally absorbed. So it's hard to link its systemic absorption and the pharmacokinetic endpoint to its action, to its local action in the GI. Sucralfate API is actually insoluble in water. So how adding inactive ingredients to make a suspension would impact sucralfate? Here is my evidence. As part of sucralfate mechanism of action, aluminum cations are released from sucralfate in acidic media and sucralfate becomes charged and thus binds to proteins in the ulcer area. Performing acid titration to sucralfate API reveals that sucralfate aggregates and form the base with adhesive properties. However, the role of the adhesive base is not fully understood. On the other hand, sucralfate suspension doesn't form the adhesive base in the acidic media, indicating that viscosity modifiers and suspending agents could prevent the formation of, so, of the paste. However, it was observed that the apparent viscosity and the sedimentation rate of sucralfate suspension increased with acid addition, indicating that at least aggregation of sucralfate occurs. Here, I want to highlight that both the mechanism of action of sucralfate and the impact of the excipients on the performance of sucralfate still are not fully understood. Thus, the PE determination of sucralfate suspension is based on a totality of evidence approach, which involves characterization of both the drug substance and the formulation of the proposed generic product that has the same active and inactive ingredients of the RLD. In summary, Q1, Q2 recommendation for all or drug product is considered when the inactive ingredients may impact the availability of the drug either at the site of action or the product performance or both. For BE determination of some locally acting GI drugs, Q1 and Q2 sameness can be a prerequisite to waive in vivo studies. The current BE in vitro recommendations of sucralfate suspension, the case study discussed, are based on the product attributes and the mechanism of action of sucralfate. Finally, demonstrating BE for sucralfate suspension is based on a totality of evidence approach of a proposed generic product that is Q1, Q2, same as the RLD. If you have any questions, please submit them in the chat box and I will be glad to answer them in the panel discussion later today. Finally, on behalf of AGD, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Suman Nandamudi, Assessor in Division of Bioculance 3 within Office of Bioculance in Office of Generic Drugs. Firstly, I would like to thank SBI staff for organizing this meeting. Today, I'll be speaking to you about approval of generic product for sucralfate oral suspension 
which is not quantitatively the same as the reference listed row. I have three learning objectives for today's talk. First, I would like for you to understand the FDA's considerations in the development of the product specific guidance for sucralfate oral suspension. Next, I would like for you to understand the rationale for recommendation of qualitative and quantitative, that is Q1, Q2 sameness between the test and reference formulations when developing the generic versions for this drug product. The final objective is describe the potential alternate approaches that can be utilized for the demonstration of biocollants for generic sucralfate oral suspension products. A little brief background about this drug product. The, lit the reference listed drug is carafate oral suspension, which is available in one strength, one gram per 10 ml, and was approved in 1993. As you can see the structure of sucralfate in this slide, it is a complex of sucrose sulfate and aluminum. It is an aluminum salt of sucrose octosulfate. The drug product is indicated in the short-term treatment of active duodenal ulcer. Per the RLD labeling, sucralfate oral suspension should be taken on empty stomach. This is critical for sucralfate to exert its action. It is a locally acting drug which is minimally absorbed from the GIT. Any small amount of sulfate disaccharide that is absorbed is excreted primarily in the urine. Before we go into the biocollants recommendations for this drug product, we will first understand the mechanism of action of sucralfate. The exact mechanism of action of sucralfate is unknown, but within the gastric environment, it is first activated to exert its action. When taken on an empty stomach, sucralfate is dissociated into sulfated sucrose and aluminum salt. Within the acidic environment, the sulfated sucrose forms polymer, and now this negatively charged polymer can interact with the positively charged proteins within the mucus such that it increases the viscosity and increase the thickness of the mucosal layer. In this way, sucralfate can increase the mucus secretion, which then reduce the diffusion of H plus ions to the ulcer base. Similarly, sucralfate polymer can also form a coat on the ulcer base so that it is protected from further attack by the H plus ions. Also, another effect is on pepsin and bile salts. Sucralfate forms stable complexes with proteins and inhibits their hydrolysis by preventing the pepsin substrate interaction. Pepsin is a cleavage enzyme which is responsible for the cleavage of proteins. Sucralfate also inhibits peptic activities by binding directly to the pepsin. Similarly, it is postulated that sucralfate also binds to the bile salts. Sucralfate is also known to stimulate the mucosal prostaglandin synthesis and bicarbonate secretion. This increase in the bicarbonate secretion can further interact with the gastric acid to reduce the gastric acidity. So all these effects can reduce the ulcer progression and increase the ulcer healing. The product specific guidance for sucralfate oral suspension provides biocoolants recommendations with an in vitro option. However, to qualify for this in vitro option, the following criteria should be met. The test and RLD formulations have the same API. Since there are no clinical studies recommended and that the drug product is a locally acting, the agency would like to reduce any uncertainty that might arise due to the differences in the formulations between test and RLD products. Therefore, the PSG recommendations include qualitative and quantitative sameness between the test and RLD formulations. That is, the difference in the amount of each XCPN should be within 5%. Comparative physicochemical characterization between the test and RLD products should be demonstrated. Lastly, acceptable bioassays. In the next slide, I'll go over the details of the 
in vitro biases that are recommended in this PSG. The text that is highlighted in blue, that is the Q1, Q2 sameness and the biases are evaluated by the Office of Biocollins. However, the API sameness and comparative chemical characterization evaluation is done by Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. All the above recommendations in the PSG, they reflect the totality of the evidence approach for the demonstration of biocollins for the generic products of this drug product. Based on the current FDA scientific thinking, in vitro testing is considered appropriate for the generic version. However, if any applicant intends to submit alternate methods to demonstrate biocollins, then the agency will evaluate these methods on the case-by-case -case basis. Given the complexity of the mechanism of action of this drug, it is not practical to develop a bioassay that can incorporate all the aspects on how sucral fate elicits its action. Therefore, based on the postulated mechanism of actions of sucral fate, the PSG recommends four bioassays. As I have discussed in the previous slide in detail, sucral fate releases aluminum ions in the acidic environment and produces a negatively charged complex which can tie bindly to the positively charged proteins such as <clears throat> albumin, excuse me, on the ulcer side. So based on this, the PSG recommends in vitro equilibrium binding study with human or bovine serum albumin. The biocoolance is based on 90% confidence intervals of the Langmuir constant K2 value being within 80 to 120%. The other mechanism of action by which sucralfate acts are inhibits the pepsin activity and binds to the bile salt. So for based on this, the PSG recommends in vitro equilibrium and kinetic binding studies with the bile salt. And similar to the HSA studies, the bioculens is based on the 90% confidence intervals of K2 within 80 to 120%. The PSG also recommends the in vitro enzyme activity assay, and the equivalence is based on quantitative comparability of percent decrease in the pepsin activity. In order to use these bioassays for bioculence establishment, the study conditions should be sensitive enough to detect the relevant differences between the test and reference standard products. Physiologically relevant conditions should be taken into consideration in conducting these in vitro binding studies. Study condition for each bioassay should be optimized to obtain an optimal and sensitive bio-relevant in vitro condition. The PSG for this drug product recommends providing optimization report for the selection of all the bioassay conditions, such as the negatively charged complex formation process, the adsorbate and adsorbent concentrations, the assay duration, and the pH condition. For example, pH condition. Sucral fate activity is pH dependent. Therefore, it is critical that optimal pH is selected. A physiological pH condition that allows for maximal binding should be selected. In case of assay duration, incubation duration should be optimized to maximize the adsorption of sucral fate to either albumin or bile salt. Now that we understand the rationale for Q1, Q2 sameness recommendation for this complex drug product, can a generic product be approved if the test formulation is not qualitatively and quantitatively same as the reference listed drug? So for the remainder of my talk, I'll go over a case study for which the proposed test formulation is qualitatively the same but differ in the amount of excipient, that is, quantitatively not same as the RLD formulation. The PSG should be viewed only as recommendations unless specific regulatory or statutory requirements are cited. In case of oral suspension products, there is no regulatory requirement for Q1, Q2 sameness. Therefore, potential Q2 differences may be justified by providing comprehensive scientific rational with multiple meaningful measures showing the lack of impact of the formulation difference on the product form reference. Any alternate BE approaches can be utilized for the bioculens demonstration. So for this case study, the test formulation is Q1 the same, but not Q2. As shown in the table in this slide, 
the difference in the amount of excipient A between the test and reference formulations is greater than 5%. Therefore, in order to justify the Q2 difference, the applicant provided the results of six bioassays as listed in this slide in addition to the studies that were recommended in the PSG for this drug product. I will not be going over the details of these studies. However, I want to make a note that all the proposed additional studies were based on the mechanism of action of the sucral fate, which I have gone over in detail in the previous slide. In order to show that the difference in the amount of excipient A between the test and reference formulations do not have any impact on the product performance, the applicant manufactured the altered test formulations that included changes in the multiple excipients along with the excipient A. All the bioassays that were listed in the previous slide were conducted using test product, reference standard product, and alter test formulations. However, the in vitro bioassay results obtained using these altered test formulations were insufficient to mitigate the BE concerns of Q2 differences due to the confounding factor of varying other excipients simultaneously. In addition to this, Office of Biocolins also has a concern on the study design for the HSA binding assay. The PSU recommends that a fixed concentration of sucral fate with varying concentrations of HSA be used to conduct the study and the Langmuir constants K1, K2 be calculated. However, in this case, the applicant used a fixed concentration of HSA with the varying concentrations of sucral fate and the constant KD value based on the Hill equation was calculated. The K2 values are not dependent on the sucral fate or HSA concentrations. However, the KD values are variable and differ when varying concentrations of HSA were used. Therefore, the applicant did not provide sufficient supporting evidence to demonstrate that its approach is more sensitive to detect the binding differences of sucral fate with HSA at, between the test and reference products than that recommended in the PSG. Based on this, the applicant was asked to repeat the in vitro bioassay studies. Based on the agency's recommendations, new altered test formulations with specific changes made only to excipient A were manufactured. The concentrations were bracketed, covering the proposed test and RLD amounts. The test LC contains lower amount of excipient A than proposed in the test product, whereas test, test HC contains higher amount of excipient A than the amount proposed in the test product. Additionally, all the bioassays were reperformed using the test product, RLD product, and these altered test formulations. These bioassays included the studies that were recommended in the PSG and some additional studies like mucoadhesion assay, delay in bile salt diffusion, and delay in acid diffusion. Additionally, the applicant also repeated the HSA binding study as per the study design recommended in the PSG of this drug product. In the next few slides, I will go over the results of the in vitro bioassays that were conducted to demonstrate that the Q2 differences do not have any impact on the bioequivalence demonstration. I would like to make a note here that all the results that are shown in the slides today are the hypothetical and not taken from any applications. To begin with the, the studies that were recommended in the PSG. This slide shows the equilibrium binding study results with HSA and bile salts. The binding profiles clearly shows that the maximal binding is established under the concentrations tested. The Langmuir constants K2 values were calculated for both the studies. As per the PSG, the 90% confidence intervals of the T by R ratios of the K2 values were calculated, and these values are within 80 to 120% thus demonstrating the capacity of protein and bile salt binding is similar between the test and reference products. This slide shows the results of the pepsin activity study. The PSG recommends that the equivalence is based on 
quantitative comparison between the test and RLD products with respect to decrease in the pepsin activity. Currently, there is no recommendation for statistical analysis for this test. The study was conducted using the test product, reference product, and the two altered test formulations with low and high amounts of the excipient A. A predefined comparative criteria was applied to demonstrate the equivalence of the test formulations to the RLD. As you can see in this slide, the inhibition profiles of the pepsin activity are comparable between the proposed test product, altered formulations, and the RLD. This shows that the difference in the excipient A amount has no effect on the inhibition of the pepsin activity. The slide here shows the results of the mucoadhesion study. Sucralfate has preferential binding to the ulcer tissues as compared to the normal tissues. The amount of sucralfate bound to the ulcer tissue was compared across different treatments. For the statistical comparisons, equivalence acceptance criteria was proposed. Based on the scientific rationale with supporting data, the agency considered the proposal to be adequate. As shown here, the sucralfate bound to the ulcerated tissue was comparable across the different treatments tested. Thus, the results indicate that the two test formulations with the varying in the excipient amounts are equivalent to the reference product. Further to demonstrate the bioequivalence for non q 2 test formulation, additional biases such as delay in bile salt diffusion study and delay in acid diffusion study were also performed. These studies were conducted to demonstrate the equivalence of the test formulations with low and high excipient amounts against as the reference standard. The assessment of delay in bile salt diffusion was performed by measuring the permeability values of the bile salts across a semi-permeable membrane. As shown in the results here, the PF values are similar among all the formulations tested. Based on the statistical criteria proposed by the applicant, the 90% confidence intervals of the TBIR ratios of PF values are within 80 to 120% when the test product is compared with the reference product, additionally when the older formulations were compared with the RLD product. The ability to delay the diffusion of acid provides important information about the bioequivalence of the test formulation to the RLD. The pH values were recorded initially and also at the end of the study duration. The pH delta values as shown in the results here are similar between all the formulations tested. Based on the statistical criteria, the 90% confidence intervals of the TBIR ratios of the pH delta values are within 80 to 120% when the test product is compared with the reference product and the altered formulations are compared with the reference product. Therefore, based on the results of all these bioassays that were submitted, provides the totality of evidence approach to demonstrate bioequivalence for non q 2 test formulation. I have two challenge questions. Challenge question one, which statements is not true? A, in vitro biosy recommendations are based on the mechanism of action of the drug. B, the PSG recommendations for demonstration of bioequivalence for sucralfate oral suspension include both in vitro and in vivo PK studies. C, physiologically relevant conditions should be taken into consideration in designing and conducting the in vitro binding studies. D. The totality of the evidence approach to assess demonstration of bioequivalence. If you have selected the answer B, you are correct. The PSG recommendations for the demonstration of bioequivalence for sucralfate oral suspension currently includes only in vitro option. Now challenge question two. What statement is not true? A. Sucralfate binds to potassium. B. An in vitro binding study with bile salts is recommended in the PSG for sucralfate oral suspension. C. The BE assessment for the in vitro binding study is based on the 90% confidence intervals of the Langmuir constant K2. D. API sameness is, reco is recommended in the PSG for sucralfate oral suspension. The answer is A. 
Sucralfate binds to proteins, bile salts, and inhibits the pepsin activity. However, it does not bind to potassium. To summarize my talk, the product specific guidance recommendations for the bioequivalence demonstration of the drug product, Sucralfate oral suspension, is based on totality of evidence approach. Any studies that deviate from the PSG recommendation or alternate approaches can be submitted, however, with sufficient scientific evidence in order to demonstrate bioequivalence. In the case study that I have presented today, the combined findings from all the in vitro bioassays provided the totality of evidence for the demonstration of bioequivalence of a non ketogenic drug product. For a complex product such as sucralfate oral suspension, applicant can seek agency's feedback through multiple communications channels such as control correspondences, product development meetings, pre-submission meetings, mid-cycle review meetings, post-complete response letter meetings at various stages for any proposed alternate BE approaches. That concludes my talk and I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have contributed for this talk. I would like to thank you all for listening. The Office of Generic Drugs ensures high quality, safe, affordable generic drugs are available to the American public. As an assessor in the Office of BioCleanse, while performing thorough evaluation to ensure that these products meet the rigorous standards for safety and efficacy, I have always in my mind that I am part of that American public and I am a patient too. So on behalf of OGD, thank you all. I'm happy to address any questions that you have in the next Q&A session. Thank you all for the great presentations. As a reminder to our audience, if you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'd like to, to introduce and welcome additional panelists. Uh, first, Dr. Lisa Hoover is a supervisory chemist, Division of Pharmaceutical Analysis in the Office of Testing Research, OPQ. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Fang Wu, Senior Pharmacologist, Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling, Office of Research and Standards in OGD, and Dr. Hong Fei Zhou, Senior Pharmacologist in Division of Bioequivalence, three Office of Bioequivalence and OGD. Looks like we have some questions coming in right now. The first few questions are addressed to Dr. Weijie Sun, and here is the first question for Dr. Sun. Why are some products just a need just need the PK and the in vitro dissolution studies to establish BE, but some products need Q1 and Q2, the same in addition to PK and in vitro dissolution studies. So several factors are considered for the B recommendations. So for example, in the case of the flutasomycin, it requires the Q1 and Q2 the same in vitro dissociation study and the in vivo PK study. And this is because the API is not stable in the GI tract. So the equivalent PK does not guarantee the equivalent amount of the API at the site of the agent. So the PK study cannot be used solely to establish BE. It needs the Q1 and Q2 the same together with the in vitro and the in vivo PK study to establish P, uh, BE. And in the case of the mesalamine drug product, and there's no API stability issue in the GI tract. So only the dissociation study and the PK study are recommended to establish B. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions. And here's the next question for Dr. Sun. Why are PK studies recommended for Fidaxomycin with Q1, Q2 to the RLD, and it seems to be, is it very similar to the absorption of vancomycin? Okay, uh, thank you for the questions. So this question is a little, a little related to the previous question. So again, several factors are considered for the B recommendations. So in the case of the vancomycin, 
because the absorption is very limited. So it is not feasible to have a vivo PK study because the bioanalytical sensitivity issue. And vancomycin is also highly soluble in the entire GI tract. So the API is expected in solution when it reaches to the site of the action. So only in vitro dissolution study is recommended if the genetic product and the RLD are Q1 and Q2 the same. And in the case of the fludazomycin, partial of the partial of the API is absorbed into the systemic circulation. So the PK study is visible, but because the uh, fludazomycin is not stable in the GI tract, so the PK cannot be used solely to establish BE. In addition, the solubility of the fludazomycin is not that high in the entire GI tract. So it needs both dissociation and the PK studies to establish BE when it is Q1 and Q2 the same. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Son, for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for you. And here's the next question. Just referring to the bioavailability being low in GI locally acting drugs. Is it possible to use multiple units of the drug unit to increase drug plasma concentrations for the PK study? Yes. So if the P product specific guidance recommends the in vivo PK study and it is acceptable to use the multiple units of the drug product to increase the drug plasma concentrations and achieve the sufficient bioanalytical sensitivities. But the total single dose should be within the labeled dose range, and the dose range is safe to the study subject. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sun. We just have one more question in this round for you, and here's the question. You mentioned in vitro equilibrium binding study is considered as a pivotal study. How many lots are needed for the in vitro equilibrium binding study? Okay, uh, thank you for the questions. So if there is no further rec recommendation in the product specific guidance, then one lot for the in vitro binding study is sufficient and is fine. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. We've got a few questions that came in from Dr. Manar Algabish. And here's the first question for Dr. Algabish. For products such as vancomycin that require multi-pH in vitro studies, would it require similar multi-pH comparative dissolution studies for post-approval changes, such as site change or dissolution profile comparison in QC media? Is that sufficient? Uh, thank you, Ray, and that's a very good question. Uh, to say, to you know, to summarize it, I will start that. It all will depend what are those changes and also how significant they are. So talking about the multi-pH dissolution, which is a recommendation, it's a BE recommendation. And that's uh, this recommendation is based on Q1, Q2 uh, uh, sameness demonstration for the vancomycin product. So if that changes, um, it did not include a Q1, Q2, uh, meaning the excipients are not um, are not there. However, the changes could impact the performance, and that's a BE a demonstration is needed. Then the competitive multi-pH solution should be uh, conducted. That's the first part. The other part about the QC uh, dissolution, uh, this recommendation is, is usually there. It's for the quality. So usually part of the release of uh, this new patch it should be there uh, anyway. So it's, it's a two different things about would that change affect quality, which is probably could impact that. And would that also uh, impact uh, the performance of the product? Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have a few more questions for Dr. Algabish, and here is the next question. If the RLD is withdrawn, can Q1, Q2 sameness be determined using the RS product? Another interesting question with 
Uh, so usually we'd say that Q1, Q2 sameness is based on the RLD. Uh, however, I would understand that, you know, it could be a company may need to do some reverse engineering to figure out uh, the composition quantity and so on. If the RLD is not there, how to figure that out? Um, you know, I would always say, generally speaking, if could be that RS product to start with is Q1, Q2 same as RLD, so you're not far off. And the second, there is always um, the option to submit a contract correspondence for FDA to ask for, uh, you know, is the bioweaver option is the, based on the Q1, Q2 sameness. So hopefully that helped answer the question. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for Dr. al -Gabesh. and here's the next question. For complex APIs that require in vitro API sameness studies to support waiver of an in vivo study, proposed approval change in the API source, would similar API sameness studies be required? Oh, another interesting post approval changes. Um, so, in short, I would say uh, yes. Uh, API sameness should be demonstrated if the source or if the API, uh, there is changes in the API source. So, you know, the short answer will be yes. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one more question for Dr. Al Algabish. And here is the question regarding QT, uh, Q2 sameness. How much compositions or amounts, concentration, of the proposed generics are expected to be the same as the RLD and are any differences allowed? Thank you, Ray. So yes, Q2 sameness, uh, you know, you're expected the product uh, to be the same, but there is uh, some differences allowed and the general practice is 5% uh, is an acceptable uh, uh, amount. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we receive a few questions for Dr. Suman Dandamudi. And here's the first question for Dr. Dandamudi. Are all bioassays required to be performed in the PSG or would only one bioassay be sufficient? Good morning all, thank you for that question. Um, as I stated during my presentation, this is a complex drug product and given the complexity of the mechanism of action for sucral fate, it is not practical to develop one bioassay that incorporates all the aspects of how sucral fate can exert its action. Therefore, uh, the PSG recommendations, uh, recommendations are based on the postulated mechanism of action. As such, um, as such, all the studies that are recommended in the PSG should be conducted for demonstration of bicolins. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a few more questions for Dr. Danda Moody. And here's the next question. Will the FDA approve an A&D application that does not? contain the extra bioassays that were discussed in the slides? Thank you for that question. I just want to remind that what I have presented in my talk today is just an example of what alternate BE approaches can be utilized if the formulation is not Q2 the same as the RLD. By stating that if ever all the criteria that is recommended in the PSG is met, that is the test formulation is Q1, Q2, the same as RLD, the API sameness between test and reference and comparative physicochemical characterization between the products, then the biases that were recommended in the PSG would be sufficient to demonstrate bicolins. And FDA in general considers the totality of evidence approach to deem the bike lens. So any any studies um, that the applicant want to propose should have sufficient scientific rational with appropriate uh, data to support these approaches. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. A few more questions for Dr. 
Dana Moody, and here's the next question. Is the sulcrophate amount corresponding to dose recommended in the RLD label appropriate for conducting in vitro binding studies? Thank you for that question. Um, the sucralfate concentration selection um, typically should be based on the method development experiments that were conducted to optimize this parameter. Uh, by stating that um, the amount that is utilized for any binding studies will typically depend on the type of adsorbate and what is the pH condition and the incubation time and so on. So as such, the sucralfate concentrations have to be optimized initially or have to provide sufficient scientific justification for be, for, to use in the in vitro binding studies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dana Moody. We do have one more question for you in this round, and here's the question. Is citing literature sufficient regarding the selection of the bile salt and its concentrations for conducting the binding studies? That's an interesting question. So um, all the study conditions that are utilized for these biases have to be optimized so that uh, an optimal and sensitive biorelevant in vitro conditions can be utilized. Uh, thus, um, the PSG for this drug product, that's the reason recommends providing optimization report for selection of any biosay conditions. And these um, these will be based, acceptance of these will be decided on case by case after the evaluation of this ANDA submission. And so uh, the, the as such, the citing literature alone wouldn't be enough to justify the bile salt concentrations that is utilized for conducting study. So because the inappropriate uh, concentration selection could lead to inaccurate K2 calculations, which may have an impact on the bioequivalence assessment. Therefore, the bile salt concentrations that are typically selected for these studies have to clearly demonstrate the rising portion of the binding curve and the maximum binding region. And as such, they should have enough points in this linear portion to have uh, appropriate estimation of this K2 linear constant. Thank you. Thank you for answering that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we received a question for Dr. Alicia Hoover, and here's the question. What are some of the analytical methods that can be employed for API characterization? Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good question. And, you know, you really need to think about the key characteristics that you need to think about with each individual product because we have so many tools that we can use to characterize these complex APIs. So we've seen several examples today and very commonly we see spectroscopic characterizations. Um, you can use Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, FTIR. You can use UV spectroscopy, Raman. Um, really commonly you'll need to use elemental analysis, particle size distribution, or differential scanning calor calorimetry, DSC. Um, today we saw some examples of the use of solid state NMR to look at the degree of cross-linking. Um, thermo thermogravimetric analysis, TGA, can be used to look at the degree of protonation. Um, and you'll also see a lot of powder X-ray diffraction. But really you need to understand what you need to characterize it. Um, and provide sufficient scientific justification and data to properly characterize those APIs. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we receive a few questions for Dr. Fang Wu. And here is the first question. How can PBPK modeling help with B assessment for locally acting, GI locally acting products? Thank you for the question. PBPK modeling to support BE assessment for GI locally acting products is an evolving area. Validated PBPK modeling can be used to predict local drug exposure. For example, biopredictive dissolution data 
at bioRelevant pH can be used as model inputs, then virtual bioequivalent simulations can be conducted for local drug amount to support BE assessment for GI locally acting products. Also, as mentioned in previous presentation, research efforts have been made on improving in vitro biorelevant dissolution methods and developing in silico models to support BE determination for GI locally acting products. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wu. We've got a couple more questions that just came in for you, and here's the next question. What are the communicating pathways with FDA if I have questions regarding using modeling to support BE assessment for GI locally acting generic products? Thank you for the question. The applicant can use pre-ANDA product development meetings, controlled correspondence, post-CRL meetings, and the to-be-launched model integrated evidence MIE industry meeting pilot to discuss modeling related questions with FDA. Regarding the MIE industry meeting pilot program, Dr. Liang Zhao will introduce it more in his talk this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wu, for answering that question. We do have one more question for you in this round, and here is the question. What is your view on the challenges of validating PBPK modeling for GI locally acting products, and what are your suggestions on overcoming these challenges? Thank you for the question. In my view, lacking data of local concentration of drugs is the major challenge for validating PBPK modeling for GI locally acting products. To overcome these challenges, currently we are conducting research and incorporating biorelevant dissolution into PBPK model and use systemic PK data as well as data from available BE studies to support validation of PBPK model for GI locally acting products. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a few questions for Dr. Hong Fei Zhou. And here's the first question for Dr. Zhou. Generally speaking, if Q1, Q2, the same as recommended in the PSG, going through a non-Q2 route appears to be more challenging and requires additional efforts then why would an applicant choose that difficult route? Thank you for the question. Um, this is a very good question, a very reasonable one from industry perspective. Uh, I think the best person to answer this question may not be me, but the applicant. However, I can here I can help you sort of some potential reasons for this kind of decision. First, uh, there, there's no regulatory requirement on Q2 sameness for oral suspension. Q1, Q2 is recommended on PSG, but not mandatory. This makes the non-Q2 formulation possible. And the secondly, there's a possibility that the applicant did not figure out the Q1, Q2, although I think this is very unlikely. Uh, more likely, probably the applicant may purposely make some improvements on the formulation to make them stand out from the competition. And, oh yeah, and it is also possible that the applicant's drug development, they started earlier before the guidance revision as mentioned, and it was finalized. And the Q1, Q2 same needs was recommended. And so if that's the case, they, they developed the, the drug product be, before the revision was published. Uh, it, it will be a combined business and science decision for the applicant to either reformulate the product or go through the alternative approach. Um, I think that's all I have right now. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have the next question for Dr. Rizzo. Is a sulcrophate pepsin binding study sufficient to serve as the in vitro enzyme or pepsin activity study? Thank you for the question. And I'm glad that you asked this question. Um, the short answer to this question is no. The reason behind it is that uh, we know sulcrophate 
as the function to inhibit pepsin activity. And the inhibition is likely work through both adsorbing pepsin and buffering hydrogen ions. So therefore, I believe the activity assay is the one that can more accurately determine the pepsin inhibition capacity by sucrophate, as that uh, will take into consideration of both mechanisms. And another reason is that we know enzyme inhibition by binding really depends on the binding side. Not all the binding works the same way. Some bindings um, just do not inhibit the enzyme activity. So to tell the real inhibition results, the activity assay is the way to go. Hope this helps and uh, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Zong. We do have one more question for you that came in, and here's the question. Are there any special considerations for the statistical analysis of an in vitro binding data? Thank you. This is a good question. Just as uh, Dr. Suman uh, has already mentioned in her talk, um, the B acceptance criteria for this in vitro binding is 80 to 120 that's different from the uh, the plasma data the acceptance criteria of 80 to 125 percent the reason behind is that the data for this in virtual binding do not need to be log transformed for for the analysis thank you thank you for responding to that group of questions Got about three, a little over three minutes left. We're going to try to get in some more questions. We've just got some that came in for Dr. Benar al -Gavish. And here's the next question for Dr. al -Gavish. And it's another question about Q2. Are the difference in the percent based on the product weight, or how are they calculated? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the difference is actually is all related or all going back to in relation to the uh, RLD. So usually it's based on the amount, you know, the amount of tests, um, you know, versus the amount in um, the RLD over the amount in RLD. So it's all based on the uh, amount or, or the weights. So it's not on the percent. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for Dr. al -Gabesh. Here's the next question, and it's regarding a sulcralfate suspension. Can the industry, can industry develop a product with a different color? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so yes, even uh, the recommendation for sucralfate, the product need to be Q1, Q2. Uh, some um, changes are permitted, including uh, the color and um, the flavor. So the answer, the quick, an the short answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for Dr. al -Gabesh. Here's the next question, still dealing with uh, sulcrophate. The PSG for sulcrophate suspension recommends API sameness and another in vitro performance-based testing. Why are the recommend recommendations also indicated that the product should be Q1 and Q2 same as the RLD? Um, as probably indicated uh, by my colleagues in their talks and with my talk as well, um, the BE demonstration for sucral fate is, is based on the totality of evidence. So this is why, uh, you know, API pay, uh, sameness and then going to the excipients, Q1, Q2 same, and then uh, the performance and uh, the uh, characterization of the product um, are among all these uh, recommendations. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We're going to try it. It's just less than a minute. This will be our final question to Dr. al -Gabish. And it's referring to slide six. The naclotide, which is a peptide of BCS class three, is listed under GI products whose PSGs recommend Q1, Q2 sameness. For this product, 
can the principles of ICH M9 BCS based waiver be applied here to achieve the sameness? Wow, that's a very specific question. Uh, so trying to uh, give my recommendations over here, I would say first, uh, the PCS uh, classification are uh, are made for oral product that being absorbed you know, under uh, pharmacokinetic studies. So trying to apply them to locally acting GI, you, know, you need to be very careful on what need to be recommended here or not. Uh, for example, the link, the link, the link load tide one is actually, it's minimally absorbed. So there's no pharmacokinetic studies are recommended for this. Um, to start with, and um, uh, and you know, speaking about the sameness, the sameness is is in, for this product. It should, should be depending, you know. Okay, I'm trying trying to take this a, a step back. So I would say, no, you cannot probably apply the waivers uh, based on this because this one, the classification or the the waivers is or the recommendation for lenclotide is not. Um, uh, it's not a, a pharmacokinetic even studies. I think it's a clinical a dependent, a clinical endpoint studies. So uh, I hope I'm trying to, uh, hopefully I answered that question. Uh, thank you. A huge thank you to our speakers and panelists for answering numerous questions that came in from the audience. We'll now enter into our lunch break until 1.35 p.m. Eastern time. Enjoy your lunch break.